Okay, great. So everyone, I'm here with Carter Sickles, author of The Evening Hour and The Prettiest Star. I usually hold up the book title. I have a galley, so okay. his cover is much more beautiful than this, but just so you see The Prettiest Star. One somewhere, but not right in front of me. Well, it's on the graphic for people who are tuning in. Um, so we recently just published an excerpt of the novel at OxfordAmerican.org. And for people who've read that, for people who haven't, I was hoping you could give us a, um, just a breakdown, a little synopsis of what this novel's about. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's great to be here and to see you, Sarah. Yeah, you too. Uh, so The Prettiest Star is set in 1986, um, and it follows Brian Jackson, who's a 24-year-old gay man and recently diagnosed with HIV, and he's lost his lover and most of his friends to AIDS. And um, he's been living in New York City for the past six years, and so he decides now to, make, to go back to his hometown in Appalachia, Ohio. And his parents, um, they decide to keep it a secret that he is gay, to keep it a secret, to keep his HIV status a secret. And um, the novel also includes the perspectives of Jess, which was the excerpt in um, Oxford American, and she's his little 14-year-old sister. So she hasn't seen her brother since she was eight years old. And then his mother, Sharon, and then Brian, who records his final summer um, with his video camera. And the novel is kind of looking at the AIDS crisis and the AIDS epidemic of the 80s and 90s through the lens of rural America. And I think it's a novel about um, shame and grief and the politics of the body and also about just family and home and um, the kind of failures of family and home, but also when love and understanding um, touch. So when you explain the novel, it's, it's, you can't talk about it without talking about Brian, who feels like you could say that he's the central character, but really the story is told from a rotating cast of characters talking about Brian. And I'm interested in what that afforded you. Like what... Mm why you would go through the mother and the sister and Brian through the lens um, in order to tell Brian's story. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. It is his story. And I, and I always knew he would be kind of the center of it, but I, I mean, I've always been drawn to novels that use like multiple narrators. And I think it's a way as for the writer to expand beyond um, the central character and be able to tell the story through multiple perspectives different angles and really then it becomes a story not just about the protagonist but about the community or the place um, or the family you know and I think this my novel I have a couple of sections in third person but most of them are first person you know rotating first person perspectives and um, and I think with kind of built into the first person narrator there are these kind of omissions or blind spots that the narrator can't um, articulate. So like Jess is this 14 year old character and she doesn't really know what's going on. She doesn't know why Brian's back, but she's also very savvy and she can kind of see things that the adult characters can't. And then she can articulate to the reader pieces that those characters wouldn't be able to. So like she, she can kind of see her father's grief and she doesn't really understand it, but she's able to articulate it in a way to the reader. So I think you can cre create kind of layers of tension there as well. But um, yeah, it was a challenge to really like move between those perspectives. And, and one thing that I, I really wanted to do was make sure they all sounded very different from each other is, you know, I didn't want, I think we've all had that where you're reading a novel and they're supposed to be these different characters, but they all sound alike. Um, so I really had to think about not only their kind of syntax and their word choices and how they spoke, but I was really, I was thinking about, um, I guess just like kind of how they see the world and what's important to them and kind of their internal voices. Um, in kind of their emotional landscape to help give me a sense of how they would speak. So like Brian is very angry and scared um, at times 
and then Sharon, his mother, is like stuck so much in her kind of denial, you know. Um, so that was kind of a way for me to think about how to, I guess, kind of inhabit their voices. Um, Brian, you know, his his scenes took his sections took a while for me to figure out, but he is an artist and he's using a a video um, recorder to record these like monologues. So he's speaking directly to the camera and that was a way to kind of frame his sections. Yeah, I think one of the, my favorite elements of the novel is the juxtaposition between the mother Sharon and the daughter Jess, because Sharon has this sense that she's able to conceal a lot of what she's experiencing and that she is on top of things and she's so together. And then you see it through Jess's perspective and she's just like reading right through that. Like she knows something's up with her mom, everything. And I mean, all you have to do is put them in a conversation, put them in a room together watching TV, like you do in the excerpt. And you see how savvy Jess is and how she's reading this. Like she hasn't learned to be inauthentic yet in a way that her parents and the people around her have. That there's, they're constantly trying to create this like, um, armor or mediate the experience between the people who they encounter and what's really going on mm -hmm. um so who was probably the easy who was the easiest one for you to fall into when you're writing um i think jess actually came to me first in a way i mean i had brian the sense of brian but i don't when i first start writing i don't know a whole lot about the characters um and i just start to understand them and habit them through the writing um but i with jess i kept thinking about like what would it be like for this kid who's just for, turned 14 for her brother to come back this brother that she loved and looked up to but hasn't seen in six years which is a, a huge span of time especially when you're a kid um so i think one of the first scenes i wrote was actually that this scene where um, when Brian comes back was uh, and, and sort of shows up. Um, but so sh she was, um, I guess, in some ways the easiest, although once I figured out that she had this whale obsession for whales <laughs> and mm -hmm. she wants to be this marine biologist, that really helped me tap into her voice too. Um, so I think like, I think about what the characters, you know, what interests them, what obsesses them, um, can, can be kind of a way into them. Sharon was like at times a difficult character to write because as you said, she sort of presents herself as having everything. She's very together. Um, and she also can't, she can't grapple with the fact that her son is dying until later in the novel. And she can't really see her own homophobia either. And so kind of writing her with all her flaws um, and to do so in a way that was, you know, I always wanted to do it from a place of love or empathy. Um, so that in its own way could be a little bit challenging. I think Brian's character is really the hardest in a way. Um, I, even though he carried the novel and he's kind of the anchor, um, it was just such a like, painful experience of what was physically happening to him and emotionally happening to him. That I had to find a way to kind of contain his, um, chapters so the lens of the um the camera lens kind of gave me a way to do that so i found myself having a similar conversation reading your book that i had when reading silas house's southernmost which is the multitude of queer experiences and how they're represented and i i had a chance to chat with silas i guess several weeks ago and i was like you know why is your central character not the queer character, but the character who is homophobic and who's grappling with all this? Don't those folks get enough of a platform anyway? And as I was reading this, you know, his response to me was like, but that's the character who's having a moral crisis. That's mm -hmm. the character who has the most propensity for change. And so when I read the opening chapters, it's like, yes, we start with a prologue that situates Brian, but then we go into Sharon and we go into Jess. And I'm like, oh, because this is about just as much about Brian as it is about the people who actually are in a moral crisis. He's in a, a literal health crisis, yeah. but they're the ones who actually need to adapt and grow and change. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. That's a really um, smart reading of it. And it's like, I think, you know, I wanted to show sort of the arc of each um, 
character and you're right with um especially with sharon but also with jess they are kind of grappling with their own um questions about their um morality right and how they're gonna love if they're gonna love and accept their son or brother unconditionally so in order to succeed at this you had to really put us in 1986 and you do that through a lot of pop culture references yeah. There's a lot of music here. So did you find yourself engaging with the music and television and all of that of, of that period? Yeah, I mean, the topic, you know, could be very heavy and just kind of emotionally um, difficult times to write about someone who's dying, to write about the AIDS um, pan pandemic and just um, the homophobia. Uh, so doing the research on the music was really kind of brought me um, some relief from that and some levity <laughs> as well. Um, I watched a lot of 80s pop videos, which are um, kind of incredible. <laughs> and like, band, 80s pop bands take themselves very, very seriously. Um, there's not a lot of irony going on. <laughs> <laughs> Big hair, ballads. Uh, but yeah, Bo and I listened to a ton of Bowie, of course, um, who's really like, at the center like brian feels this deep connection to bowie because of what you know he was like growing up in this small town in appalachia in the 70s and early 80s and bowie was like this just flamboyant electric kind of um queer figure who really pushed um like by gender binary and was very fluid in his sexuality and his presentation of that um and i think he just showed brian that this this other world existed, you know, that there's so many possibilities out there. So it, it really, I listen to, I don't listen to music when I'm writing because the lyrics kind of get in the way for me, but anytime I wasn't writing, I try to stay, you know, in the world of the novel, just walking around the neighborhood or driving in my car. So I listen to a lot of Bowie. Um, and then I listen to a lot of other pop stuff because Jess is 14 and you know, she's listening to a lot of Madonna and Whitney Houston and um, uh, Prince. Um, so, you know, that part was a lot of kind of fun. And I did watch some TV shows and movies, um, commercials. I mean, it's so easy to find all of that stuff, right? Just by, by Googling it and kind of and I mean, I grew up in the 80s too. So a lot of it was just memories I had, but then kind of um, tapping into those. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of other mediums, you just recently had the really, I would imagine really awesome experience of having your first novel, The Evening Hour, adapted into film. Um, what was it like to see a, your novel put into this different form that's got actors and a score yeah. and a set and all that yeah it was a really i mean it was an amazing experience it um um it was optioned kind of right after the book came out which was in 2012 and it's just been a really long process it's an independent film to for it to all come together but you know the director Braden king the screenwriter elizabeth palmore like i think they made a lot of changes it's its own work of art now but they try to stay really true to the book to the characters to the tone and um of the book and to the place you know it's set the book is set in west virginia but they set they filmed it in harlan kentucky and they really um i don't know they they really reached out to people in the community there um my friend robert guype who is the author of trampoline was kind of instrumental and in, because he lives in Harlan, um, connecting them with with people um, who could act as extras and just work on the sets and things like that. So it was really cool to be able to go and check out the, um, I got to be on set a few times. And so that was really, yeah, it was surreal and amazing. And um, I don't know, I just, you know, a lot of people ask, like, were you worried about uh, them not kind of sticking to the story or what it would look like when it was finished. And it, in some ways, I just felt like I was ready to let go of this. And the novel is still the novel. And this is, um, you know, it's still sticking true, like I said, to the story, but it's its own art form. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, I, I hope it's really showing like the testament to the power of, of complicated characters and, and um, 
you know, engaging story. But yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, a great experience. And it was also like, yeah, sort of watching how a film, I mean, I love film, but seeing it from the other side, you know, and like, where were there similarities between filmmaking and writing and how was that different? And, you know, I was thinking like one thing is just how they block a scene and they'll shoot, shoot the same scene over and over and over <laughs> like 20 times um, from different angles. But it, it made me think of writing, you know, and just like revising that same scene over yeah. and over again or trying it from different perspectives. Um, and even like, finding those particular details, like what the character is wearing, you know, the objects that the set designer is including, all of those things that be really kind of perfect to keep the, re to keep the viewer kind of in the dream of the movie. And I think we're doing similar, you know, doing something similar with our writing, like trying to keep our readers there. Um, yeah, I think the challenges in telling story through a novel and telling a story through a movie are really different. Like, in a novel, we're working really hard to show the physicality that's backing up the emotional life. And in a movie, you base you only have the physical, and then the emotional has to be translated through that. Yeah. And so, I actually, seeing the blocking and set and like having people do like costume design yeah. as planted a seed in you, or as you're writing, you're actually putting more of the physical world or some of the laying some of the plumbing in. For your uh, yeah, I mean, I think that I've always been, I tried to really be a very kind of physical writer. Like I'm always sort of, you know, as I said, I don't know who my characters are um, from the beginning. It's kind of a process of discovery for me. So I tend to start with the physical. So I'm thinking of like what they look like and objects and um, setting, like place is always really important for me. And that can be kind of a way to enter. And then I get can get more to their kind of interior um, lives. But yeah, I don't, I don't know if the, like, watching the film process has had, like, um, a direct influence on my writing yet at this point. Although I will say for people out there who are working on novels and if they, you know, want their novel to um, be adapted into a film or they want to write a screenplay, like, you know, um, maybe not having quite so many characters like I had in mind <laughs> or quite so many settings, um, you know, a major flood and a dam break is probably not going to be able to be translated in, <laughs> on the screen, at least with an indie film. So yeah, that was sort of interesting because once they kind of broke it down, it's like, I didn't, I realized just how many characters I had and how many kind of locations I had in my novel. But you know, that's why they're different. And that's yeah. why, exactly. you know, what makes a good movie is not what makes a good novel necessarily. It is really interesting to think about I always try to think about like which movies are better than the book and there's few like there's few. the godfather oh yeah right. you know like, there's a few that i can think of and then trying to i always try to pick apart why that would be um so you were listening to a lot of 80s stuff being in, in an 80s world when you're working on the prettiest star we now find ourselves in this space where of social distancing and I at least have been turning a lot more to, to art and entertainment. What has been, what have been your touchstones? What's been comforting to you during this time? Yeah, I mean, I think like so many of us, I've just been, you know, there's definitely days of just feeling adrift and my mind feels foggy or I'm, you know, dealing with a lot of um, anger or outrage or grief. Um, so, I, I actually have been reading quite a bit and that has, um, um, I don't know, been giving me some sense of solace and hope, I think. Um, I've been reading um, Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel. Uh, yeah. It missed, you know, when it first came out a few years ago and since her latest book just came out as um, the last one of the trilogy, it's been great to just sort of disappear from what's going on. Yeah, if you want to process anger, that's a, that's a good way to do it. Right. And, and just um, transport me to 1500s uh, England. So I've been reading that, but I've also been reading some short stories. Um, Leah Hampton's book, Fuck Face, which will be out uh, in July. I just read those stories and they're 
they're fantastic and they take place in um, Appalachia and in the South and they're, they're funny and smart uh, collection. And, um, and then I've, I haven't been able to really watch movies. I don't know if you have been just like, I, I'm, too, I'm not focused enough, but I've been watching a lot of TV series. The Americans has been one. Good one. Um, it's oh, good to pick a long one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> got a long time to go. We're working our way through RuPaul's Drag Race, and there yeah. are a lot of episodes. Yeah, yeah, good. And then I'm just trying to take a lot of walks and get outside. So what does the book tour look like right now? Good question. <laughs> it looks like this, a lot of Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, um, the book, so the book has um, been pushed back to May 19th, so it was going to come out in April, so now the pub date is May 19th. Um, of course, all my April events are uh, canceled, um, but we're trying to move some of those to um, Zoom, so I'll be doing a reading with um, Paula Sicki, whose memoir later just came out uh, next week on Thursday, and um, yeah, I think we'll just, you know, bookstores and publishers, Hub City, my publisher, publishers, like everyone's being really inventive and um, great about this and trying to figure out how we can still get um, the book out there to readers, you know. So we can pre-order from Hub City right now? Yeah, you can pre-order from Hub City and I signed a bunch of copies last time I was there. So you can get a signed copy if you order from Hub City, but you know, bookshop is another, bookshop, bookshop.org is another great resource. And, you know, what other independents are, if you have an independent that's still open, you know, in your community, then of course support them. So I don't want to put you on the spot here because you might not, you know, bookshop is, um, readers can actually select which bookstore the, the, the proceeds go to? I believe so. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not an expert on it, but that's what yeah. it seems. Yeah, they get it and they get a cut from it. So it's much better to use that um, than, than the, the place the, that shall not be named. The place that we shall not name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we've got um, the excerpt from Justice Perspective up at OxfordAmerican.org. I think it's a really great entry into just the variety of voices that you'll get to. Uh, experience in this so I hope that everyone will go check it out if they haven't already pre-order the book now from Hub City or your local uh, bookstore or bookshop.org and it'll be out May 15th and of course keep your eye out for any readings or virtual stops that Carter will be making um, that's all I've got Carter um, thank you so much for joining us and for talking about your both of your books thank you this has been great great all right, signing off. See you later. Bye.